his wife entered the foster care system and they took ownership of two young people and the courts have decided that they are ready to go back to their mother but this family is not so sure they have a lot of uneasiness about it now what do you do in a situation like that what would you pray for when I read my friend's prayer requests I immediately identified its spiritual nature and honestly I can't think of anything else for which to pray I I can't think of anything better for which to pray and again just in terms of review I want to remind you what he sent me initially he said this Monday is one week out from the trial date please join us for a day of prayer this Monday here is what we are praying for each hour and in the last lesson two weeks ago we covered five of the 13 prayer requests and we said that the spiritual mind prioritizes prayer and again I want you to see the continuity of all of this, and I think it merits our time to read through all of them. At 8 a.m., he said, pray for our foster daughter, image bearer of our father, that she comes to saving faith in Jesus Christ. At 9 a.m., he wrote, pray our foster son, image bearer of our father, comes to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And we said the spiritual mind invests in young faith. At 10 a.m., he wrote, pray their hearts, minds, and bodies are protected from trauma and sin. And we said that the spiritual mind shelters the vulnerable. At 11 a.m., he wrote, pray for the judge to have wisdom, to make a judgment in the best interest of these children. And we said that the spiritual mind seeks wisdom. At noon, he said, pray for both attorneys to value doing what's best for the children above winning. And we said that the spiritual mind pursues justice. This morning, I want to consider the spiritual nature of the remaining prayer requests. At 1 p.m., he texted, pray for the birth mother and her father, the co-conservator, to come to a saving faith and pursue repentance of sin particularly sin that might put their kin in danger. At 2 p.m., he wrote, pray for the biological father to come to a saving faith and repent from the ways that have him in his current circumstances. The spiritual mind, I want to say this morning, is committed to saving souls. If you're committed to Christ, then it naturally follows that you're committed to winning the lost. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15, Paul says, it is a trustworthy statement. You can bank on it. Deserving of full acceptance. He's saying, have no doubt that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost. And you know what I've done with this verse? My entire preaching career, I have focused on Paul, that he's the foremost of all sinners, that, that he said at that time and in that place, there's never been a sinner bigger than Paul. And I got to tell you, I'm convinced that I buried the lead because the lead in this passage is that Christ Jesus came into the world to do what? To save sinners. To save you and to save me. And saving souls is about setting the proper example. I think about Philippians chapter 2 and verse 15 that, that says we are to shine as lights in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. I want to tell you, about a very sad situation. You already know some of you have heard about the nine-month-old child that was left in an automobile on one of the hottest days of the year. And this is where Michael Todd preaches in South Texas. The grandmother forgot about him, and he didn't make it. It's tragic. Well, I got a text from Michael yesterday, and he told of this family that came to the visitation. And after... 
their experience at the visitation, they showed up the next Sunday morning. And do you know why they were there? Because they said, I want to be at a church and I want to worship in a place where a mother who could lose a son in a situation like that has that kind of faith. You see, brothers and sisters, that's part of saving the lost is setting the proper example. It's about building, trusting relationships. It really is true that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That is a true statement. It might be tired. It might be trite, but it is still true. We can have all the right information, but if we don't build relationships with people, we're not going to be able to share it with them. They're just not going to be interested. We can find opportunities to serve. This is this is part of evangelism. And what I want you to understand, setting the right example is evangelistic. Building relationships with people that are in the world, that, that is part of evangelism. And finding opportunities to serve is also part of evangelism. Don't tell me that you can't evangelize. It is our purpose in this life. There is a place for you. And I want you to see ministry as a great big wheel. And what I want you to see is evangelism is the hub of that wheel. And every ministry that takes place in a local body is a spoke coming off of that wheel. And they're all attached to the hub. The hub, the center of church life, is evangelism. Saving souls is about offering invitations. Do you understand? You're evangelistic when you say to somebody, you ought to come to worship with me. Attend the Flower Mound Church of Christ. That's evangelistic. Do you, I, really, could we put a number on it? How many people do you think are members of the body of Christ? Not only today, but throughout time, simply because some Christian somewhere said, would you come to worship with me? I, I think the number would be astronomically high. It's evangelistic to invite someone to sit down and study the Bible. And again, maybe you're not comfortable doing that. That's okay because saving souls is about teaching the gospel and we have plenty of willing people here, don't we? And I believe the number of people that are willing to teach and capable of teaching, it continues to grow. There are more people who are actually looking for opportunity. Saving souls is about setting the proper example, building trusting relationships, finding opportunities to serve, offering invitations, teaching the gospel. And listen, this is important. Saving souls is about bringing back the fallen. We have to know that when we bring them in the front door, if they go out the back door, we haven't done what God has asked us to do. It has to be our mission and purpose to keep the saved saved. Look at James chapter 5. In James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20, James says, My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth, if, listen, we know from our own experience that there are going to be those that stray away from the truth. It's going to happen. The if is there really because of the latter part of the verse. He says, my brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, well, then what, James? Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. When you're involved in the work of evangelism, meaning teaching an alien sinner the gospel and watching them be baptized into Christ, or when you're involved in keeping the saved safe, when one who's departed and we bring them back, the text says you are saving his soul from death and covering a multitude of sins. And let me add one more thing. We are most like Jesus when we're dedicated to the ministry of reconciliation. The spiritual mind is committed to saving souls, and at 3 p.m., my friend wrote to me, pray for us, that we guard against pride, bitterness, comparison, and our hearts be encouraged no matter the outcome. Just think of the spiritual nature of that prayer. If you were in that situation, 
Wouldn't pride be a problem? Wouldn't you think you're doing a better job? If you lose those kids, wouldn't it be hard to be bitter? Wouldn't you struggle with comparing the way you're doing things with the way they were doing things? And wouldn't you struggle for your heart to be encouraged no matter the outcome if it didn't work out the way you thought it ought to work out? That's a great prayer. And the spiritual mind is pure in heart. I can't emphasize enough how imperative it is to guard your heart. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23 says, Guard your heart with all diligence for out of it come all the issues of life. Look at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. My son-in-law is teaching the Sermon on the Mount on Sunday mornings for Bible class. We had a, a phenomenal discussion this morning. Tremendous class participation. A very edifying class. And I want to encourage you, if you're not coming to Bible class, to put that on your calendar. But in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8, I learned that you're not supposed to say blessed. But I'm going to have to tell you, I didn't even realize I was doing it. And then you want to know what's really interesting about this? Is that the only place that I say blessed is in the Beatitudes. He went to Psalm 1, how blessed is the man. I'd never said how blessed is the man. I guess I don't even know why I do it. I guess it's just because that's the way I've always heard it. But when it comes to the Beatitudes, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8, Jesus said, Blessed, or blessed, are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Don't you want to see God? Listen, that's the whole purpose of faithful living, is because we not only want to see God, we want to go where God is. We want to dwell with God throughout eternity. And Jesus said, Happy, blessed. Blessed denotes an inner form of spiritual prosperity. But what I want you to know is some of the devil's most effective lies are that we don't have control. Some of the devil's most effective lies are that we're really powerless. He wants to convince us that he has the control. He wants to convince us that he makes us choose poorly. It wasn't so many weeks ago that I extended the invitation on a Wednesday night, and we evaluated that familiar phrase, the devil made me do it. No, he didn't. James 1 tells us where sin comes from. It, it emanates from within each one of us. Do you know what I mean when I talk about a duality statement? It's when someone says something, and you can take it one of two ways. And what I want you to understand this morning is you can take it positively, or you can take it negatively. You can take it as a compliment, or you can take it as an insult. You, you can take it encouragingly, or you can take it discouragingly. Look at Paul's words to the young evangelist Titus and Titus chapter 1 and verse 15. Titus chapter 1 and verse 15 says, To the pure, all things are pure. Do you see, when you're pure of thought, it doesn't matter what anybody says, you are going to interpret what they said purely. And then he says, But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their mind and their conscience are defiled. You, you see, to this kind of person, you can say something pure and they will twist it. They can make something ugly out of it. And so I believe that Paul is telling us that we need to find the good and meditate on it. No matter what is said, you find the good and you meditate on that. And you have a choice as to how you will hear and interpret what other people say. The spiritual mind is pure in heart. At 4 p.m., my friend asked me to pray for CASA. CASA is a court-appointed special advocate. 
He said, pray for CASA to persevere in their work to advocate on behalf of all orphans. That's a pretty significant prayer request. There are a lot of orphans out there, a lot of unclaimed children, uncared for children. And what I want you to know this morning is the spiritual mind cares for the less fortunate. Identifying, inviting, and investing with these less fortunate is God's business. And we, brothers and sisters, are his employees. We have to identify him. Where are the less fortunate? We need to invite them into our homes. We need to do what we can to not only help them, but invest in them for the long term. Look at Psalm 68. Psalm 68, verses 5 and 6. This tells us something about our God. The text says, a father of the fatherless. That's who our God is. A father of the fatherless and a judge for the widows is God in his holy habitation. God makes a home for the lonely. He leads out the prisoners into prosperity. Only the rebellious dwell in a parched land. Do you know what this passage says? It says that God takes care of people and he uses us to do it. Now, I have another sad tale. I want to be careful how I say this, and and yet I think it's important for you to understand the background of a young man whose father decided to take the, the life of his wife and then take his own life, and that left a young boy without a place to live. And so this was a classmate of Kyle Stanton. And do you know what his mother and father did? They said, we're going to give him a place to live. And Donnie turned his office into another bedroom. And his his junior year and his senior year, he had nothing to worry about in terms of food, clothing, and shelter. That's identification. That's inviting. That's investing. Who does that? Do you want to know who does that? Donnie and Karen Stanton do that. Do you want to know who does that? Christians do that. Sons and daughters of the Almighty. In James chapter 1 and verse 27, James said, This is pure and undefiled religion. In the sight of God, our Father, to visit orphans and widows in their distresses and to keep oneself unstained from the world. I wonder, which is easier? To visit orphans and widows or to live a moral life? Here, they're both used to define pure and undefiled religion. And I think it's probably pretty easy to get up on your high horse and feel pretty good about your moral living. But what is pure and undefiled religion? James says it's to visit. What does that mean? You go check in on them and then forget about them? No, we understand that the Greek word here literally means to meet needs. That's our calling. You might be asking, what can I do? Listen, I hope you are, and I want you to know, this steps on my toes. I have to answer this question too. Well, let me tell you one thing you can do. You can honor this prayer request of my friend and not only pray for the two foster kids in his home, but for all of the less fortunate. You can look for opportunities. I believe that if you look for opportunities to fulfill this command in James 1 and verse 27, the Lord will help you find them. You can donate. You can take what God has freely given you and freely give it to the less fortunate. You can volunteer. Do you know that we have children's homes right here in DFW? And there are opportunities regularly for you to be able to go over there and volunteer your time. That's what Christians do. 
And listen, I know this is a huge step. I, I know it is, but the, the fact of the matter is I have to include it on the list. You could adopt. You could. You could make that level of investment. I think about my dear friends from right here in the Metroplex. One of them was born in Denton, the other in Fort Worth. They, they met at Oklahoma Christian. They became missionaries for 10 years, and, and they adopted five kids. How awesome to use everything that God has given you, in fact, in adoption, to offer your very lives in service to the less fortunate. The spiritual mind cares for the less fortunate. Listen, the spiritual mind is committed to saving souls. The, the spiritual mind is pure in heart. And not when it's easy, right? Like, how easy is it to be good when, when everything in your life is good? The, the, the spiritual mind is pure in heart. When, when everything within you is telling you, you don't want to be. And, and the spiritual mind cares for the less fortunate. Listen, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about Ephesians chapter 6. In verse 18, that we should pray about everything. And we talked about that at all times men ought to pray. Luke 18 and verse 1. And the reason I had Dan read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17 is because I felt like it put a different spin on exactly what Paul calls us to do here. Pray without ceasing. What does that look like? It means that you pray at 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock and 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock and 12 o'clock and 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock and 3 o'clock and 4 o'clock. And next week, I promise, we're going to cover the last prayer requests that were sent to me. And, and I had several of you ask me, hey, this has been going on a while, so what happened? Well, Again, I've got to be careful. I don't want to share too many details, but the birth mother missed a court appointment. And so the whole process was delayed a week. But suffice it to say that the judge wasn't happy about that. And so it leans in the favor uh, of the foster parents right now. We don't know how it will turn out, but I want to encourage you. You want to know what can I do? You can pray for these two young people and for all who are in the foster care system, for orphans because they need it. And God looks out for the less fortunate. He uses us to do it. If you're subject to the invitation of the Lord this morning, we want to give you an opportunity to respond. If you need to become a child of God, just have to be willing to confess Christ and be buried with him in baptism. Obviously, repentance is part of it. If you need the prayers of the church, whatever your need is this morning, won't you let it be known as together we stand and sing.